pronounce it in French. It's probably Briyuan or something like that, since the French never pronounce the double L. They always, double L is like a Y, so Briyuan. But we always call it Briyuan, so in America. Okay. I had it pronounced as An in, in French. So this is called a Briyuan zone. This zone over here. So let's think about this for a 3D structure then. We derive a lot of this salient feature for 1D. And for 3D, how would the block rotate theorem look like? <laughs> So for 3D, we know that this has to be true. We have periodic lattices in three dimensions, but then the lattice vector that we have is that if the geometry, if the lattice is translated by this lattice vector, where A1, A2, and A3 are vectors, but N1, N2 and N3 are integers. Okay? Then this forms what is called the lattice vector. So any two points that you can think of in the lattice, it's easier to draw this in two dimensions. It's harder to draw this in three dimensions. If you can think of any two points, or any any two points, you can always get there by adding the number of lattice vectors you can get from point A to point B uh, in the crystal lattice. And that happens in 3D too. And that is, in general, represented by this lattice vector. Okay? And in three dimensions, then we have a periodic potential. The periodic potential will have the property that if you were to translate the periodic potential by this lattice vector, it becomes itself. Okay, so if there's a periodic potential, you just move it around, it becomes itself. Okay? And then the Schrodinger equation that you have to solve will look something like this. You can go through the same kind of uh, subspace projection method, expand your psi in terms of a basis function, and then you have to impose, you will have to impose block locate theorem for this psi. Okay? The block locate theorem will say that In general, a wave function in three dimensions for Schrodinger wave equation will look something like this. That it will consist of a plane wave propagating through the crystal lattice in three dimensions, but modulated by a periodic function. Okay, this is the block locate theorem in 3D. I can prove that this function has to be periodic because this is periodic. And very similar to the proof that we went through in 1D. Okay, because if you translate the problem by this amount, okay, if you translate the problem by this amount, if you translate it by that amount, or r prime equal to that, then the problem remains unchanged. And because the problem has to remain unchanged, this has to be a periodic function. So you end up with the fact that U P of R plus R sub L must be U P itself because of this fact. With the argument that the problem remains unchanged. If you were to if you were to move the table or move your experiment by that much, the problem remains unchanged. So that U P must be periodic. Okay? So then there are this kind of a generalized Fourier series expansion that you must be aware of. 
that in 1D we have this very simple expansion. to n pi over x, n is to the minus infinity to infinity. But the generalization of this to three dimension is something quite interesting, that if this were to be a periodic function or the periodic lattice, not, not any other lattice, but the periodic lattice that you're addressing, they have, they have this property, okay? You can be a lattice that looks like that, you can be a lattice that looks like that. I'm just drawing two-dimensional rendition of this because two dimension is kind of difficult to draw. It can be a lattice that uh, just looks like that, for instance, in two dimension. And then you have, you have 3D a rendition of these things as well. Okay? So if this function is periodic. It can be expanded in terms of a generalized uh, Fourier series expansion, where I will write it as such: g e to the i k or g dot r. So this is the generalization of the above, where this g is the vector represented by l1 v1 plus L2, B2, plus L3, B3. What are B1, B2, and B3? L1, L2, and L3 are integers. OK, they are integers. What are B1, B2, and B3? B1, B2, and B3 are chosen so that UP retains this property. UP R plus RL must be UP RL R. So it must be that if UP remains unchanged, if I translate it by a lattice vector, then the right hand side must also remain unchanged. What it says is that if the right hand side remains unchanged, then this must be true. It must be e to the i. G dot R. So G has to be chosen. G has to be chosen so that e to the i G dot R L equals one. Okay. What is that G then that has that property? Okay. You can see that this is a generalization of this concept. This concept means that e to the two i n pi over a, and if x is l times a, this equals 1. So if x stays on the lattice, this number is always retained or maintained to be 1. So if r stays on the lattice, okay, this always becomes 1. Then what is g? I can derive g, but it's better to write down g by inspection. And then give you the answer and prove that it is the correct G. Okay? G consists of B1, B2, and B3. These are integers. I just give you the answer and convince you that these are the correct answers. B1 is A2 cross A3 over A1 dot A2 cross A3 times 2 pi. Okay? And then B2, very similar to the above, but you just swap the indices and then make this into A1 dot A2 cross A3. Okay, it doesn't matter actually, you can rewrite the denominator by other ways, but let me tell you later on why it doesn't matter. And then the third one is A1 cross A2 dot with A1 dot A2 cross A3 times 2 pi. I claim this to be the correct answer. I also want to make you aware of this identity. A1 dot A2 cross A3 is the same as A3 dot A1 cross A2 
is the same as a2 dot a3 plus a1. Okay, this identity should be memorized. It's very easy to memorize because we just rotate these three indices. You move this to the front, you move the other two to the forward, you move this to the front, you move the other two to the forward. So the denominator can be written in many other ways, or two other ways, but I just wrote the denominator in one way. I want to convince you that B1 has this property, B1 dot A2 is equal to B1 dot A3 is equal to zero. Okay, this is obvious, because B1 is formed by A2 cross A3, so this must be true. B1 must be orthogonal to A2, must be orthogonal to A3, this must be true. I also want to convince you that B1 dot A1, okay, if I were to dot this with A1, okay, the numerator becomes the same as the denominator. This is equal to two pi. Okay? So, if I multiply this out, if I were to multiply that out, G dot RL, let me do it over here instead of running over to the other side of the blackboard. G dot RL would be some integer values times, uh, if I multiply them out, would be A1 dot B1 plus some integer value times A2 dot B2 plus some integer value times A3 dot B3. Okay, this must be true because I construct this so that they are always orthogonal to A3 and A1. This is always orthogonal to A1 and A2. So if we multiply this out, G multiplied by RL. G is given by this. RL is given by where I have over here. The cross terms always vanish. The cross terms always vanish, giving me the self terms. The self terms always evaluate to two parts. Okay, I can go through the same exercise for B2 again. It always gives me B2 dot A2 equals 2 pi. And then B3 dot A3 equals 2 pi. So this will be, in total, some integer times 2 pi. Okay, G dot RL equals to some integer times 2 pi. Because that equals some integer times 2 pi, this always equals 1. Okay? That always equals 1. You can also prove orthogonality of this uh, generalized Fourier series expansion. I can call this a generalized Fourier series expansion. Fourier okay, this is a, just a generalized Fourier series expansion. In three dimensions, you can think of it that way. Okay. So by the same token, I can prove the other things that when I construct the matrix equation to solve, for the solution of the block flotate mode, I will get the eigenvalues. The eigenvalues must be a function of k. Now, previously in 1D, the eigenvalue was a function of k. Now this eigenvalue must be a function of the k vector that I pick in my block flotate theorem, where this go. Okay, I erase this over here. Okay. The eigenvalue must be a function of k. Okay. And again, I can prove that this block locate mode must also be periodic in k. That is, if I were to add, say, a g, g has a name actually, g has a name and it's called the Reciprocal lattice vector. OK? 
Okay, it's called the reciprocal lattice spectral theorem. This is just called the lattice spectral. So if I were to translate my block locate mode by a reciprocal lattice spectrum, I will get on the right hand side dot r u p r, and then I can lump this again together with u p r and call my u p r tilde to be u p r into i g dot r. This again is a periodic function, it's a periodic function in R on the lattice vector, and then black and back to square one with respect to my block locate theorem. This is also a block locate mode, and if I were to find the eigenvalues, I go to the same procedure as before. Okay, so if I were to translate my k vector by the reciprocal lattice vector, I get like the same sets of eigenvalues. So the the picture, the EK diagram in 3D, this EK diagram in 3D repeats itself just like the lattice vector but in the reciprocal lattice space, okay, in the Fourier space. If I call the K space a Fourier space, this EK repeats itself. It's hard to visualize it, but there are lots of diagrams that you can see, like people would draw diagrams like that. Okay, in 3D, and this would just be the first zone, the first zone of the EK diagram. This is very complicated because E is a function of K. Okay, you will have um, have uh, three dimensions, and in most solid state textbooks, they draw pictures like this, which is only that of the first zone, which is called the pre one zone, the first pre one zone. Okay, and every information is contained in the first pre one zone. And you can see sometimes very beautiful pictures of this uh, EK diagram. Okay? And then sometimes they will draw this diagram like this. Instead of drawing it in 3D, they move along some axis, some lines, and just plot the E as a function of K as you march along a certain line like, as in indicated on this picture over here. Then your EK diagram will look something like that. You essentially stretch this 3D diagram out into 2D so that you look at it more easily. Okay. Okay. So and then when you have this kind of thing then then, um, then you can think of this EK diagram that you have in 3D as an extension of the type binding model you have in 3D. Okay. Say if you have a whole bunch of lattice, and if that this lattice is, lattice points are far apart, you can think of them, each of them as being a potential wall. Okay, a potential wall. Okay. And then each of these potential wall can trap an electron and then okay. And if this lattice points are far apart, then the energy level of the trapped electron would be very simple, just like what you have studied in 1D. Or what you have studied, say, if you have taken another quantum mechanics course, what you have studied of the hydrogen atoms. Okay, you have energy levels that might look something like this discrete until it reach the continuum. So the energy level of an atom, or the E of an atom, will always look something like this. Okay? Discrete levels. And then if there are n atoms again, you can think of this being in 3D. If they are not coupled to each other, each of these energy levels will be n degenerate. And then in the tight binding model, you will assume that the wave function that you can use to approximately solve this problem is the wave function of a single atom. Okay, you can use the orbitals, all the wave functions that are found by a single atom, and translate them in a different atomic location, and then plug that into 
your equation uh, to obtain the resulting energy level. If you have only two atoms, each of these will split into two. Okay? If you have three atoms, each of these will split into three. If you have n atoms, each of these will split into n. So this essentially gives rise to your band structure. This is the atomic spacing. Atomic spacing. Inverse. Okay, inverse of the atomic spacing. The closer the atomic spacing is, the more the energy level will split, will split and then that gives you the band structures. And you can look at the band structures as coming from here, or you can also argue that the band structure is coming from the block locate theorem. Okay, those are actually different, two different ways of looking at this problem. Are there any questions so far? So, this knowledge is actually quite important in electrical engineering because when we deal with semiconductor material, we are essentially having an electron moving about in a crystalline lattice. And that crystalline lattice can be coming from your semiconductor compounds. Okay? But let's try to understand semiconductor physics slightly better. And in order to understand semiconductor physics, let's talk about the Fermi direct distribution. So, what we see is that um, if there are n atoms together, each of these energy levels will have n degeneracy and then you will split into n different levels. n can be a very, very large number. n can be a very large number. And so, every time you solve for the eigenvalue of the system, you find that there are millions and millions of them, even in atomic spacing. Okay. Then we have to think about this Fermi direct distribution that if all these energy levels and you start to put electrons into this system, how would the electrons move or occupy these different levels? What kind of law, what kind of distribution law would the electron follow in order to occupy these different energy levels? And those electrons will occupy these different energy levels according to the Fermi direct distribution. And in that law, it says that the electron will find the lowest energy state to go into first. Okay? And if I'm the first electron to come about, I will go into the lowest state. And then if the next electron comes about, the next electron can come and occupy the same state if the electron is of the opposite spin. That we learn from the Pauli explosion principle. No two electrons can occupy the same state simultaneously. And if the two electrons have opposite spins, they are not considered to be identical electrons. So they can go into the same state. And if this state has been occupied by two electrons, <coughs> Then the next state up will be what the next electron has to come by and occupy. And then they will occupy this state according to a certain distribution law. And that is a Fermi direct distribution law. And that law says that the probability of an energy state E to be occupied if the energy level has been split, if you look at any given energy level E, the probability that it has been occupied is given by this for me direct distribution. We'll derive this for me direct distribution later on. Okay, where KB is a Boltzmann constant. Okay, it's a Boltzmann constant. Uh, what is the value of the Boltzmann constant again? Does anybody remember? Uh, I remember the value of it. Three point uh, I, I don't know. It's the type of the mind. Do you remember what it should be? I just remember as a 
You need that convert or something? Yeah, I have I have T three hundred K. Three hundred. Okay, so you can figure out what you should Okay, it's a small constant actually. KBT has a value of energy. This is energy, okay? E B is energy. So milli electron volt is energy. Okay, so it follows this uh, box, uh, this uh, Fermi direct distribution law. And if you were to plot this, it has an appearance of something like this versus energy. So if the temperature is zero, it actually has a very, very interesting behavior. If you set T is to the zero, okay, this thing becomes infinitely long. So if E is less than EF, this becomes infinitely large in the negative direction. This term will become zero. So, so if EF is here, okay, then the distribution will look something like this for T equal to zero. Okay, the distribution will look something like this. Because when E is larger than EF, this becomes infinitely large in the positive direction and the denominator becomes very, very large and it just goes down to zero. Okay. If E is less than EF, it just fit up to one thing. Okay. And if the temperature is not zero, then this curve is more gradual. It might look something like this, okay, that um, EF is the value where it goes to half. Okay. And actually it changes. EF is not always equal to itself. This EF is that T is good to zero. Okay. And then in terms of the EF, my shift to some other value. Okay, EF at T not equal to zero. And then you might get different plots of these functions too. Um, you might get different plots of this function. Okay, T larger than zero. So this for me direct distribution will look something for different temperature it will look different. What it says is that at zero temperature the electrons are frozen into the lowest energy state. But higher than temperature they can go into higher energy state due to this distribution law. Physically that's what it means. Electrons have a chance of moving away from the low energy state then occupy some of the higher energy state. And this E sub F is called the Fermi level. Or sometimes called the chemical potential. Okay? The chemical potential on the Fermi level is a function of temperature. It's the place where E equals E F. This becomes half with E equals E F. In order to give the or to keep the number of electrons being the same, okay, that this point actually moves about as the temperature changes. The value that it crosses, the half value point, changes as the temperature changes. So this gives you a physical feeling as to what this function means. The higher the temperature, the more likely that the higher energy state can be occupied. So you can use this to actually describe uh, the behavior of uh, semiconductors, metals, and insulators. Semiconductor is what electrical engineers studies. Okay, then you have metal, and then you have insulators. What are the differences between these three kinds of materials then? So we see that a degenerate eigenvalue is split into different bands. Okay, because of these different bands, we can just use a simple diagram to represent this band. And if I were to draw E, I will have a conduction band. 
okay, this could be position. Okay, this could be position of the crystal lattice, and this conduction band could be occupied here. And then this is the valence set. This could be X, say, for instance. And then if the Fermi level is somewhere in between here, then if the temperature is non zero, it seems that if I put electrons into this system, if I put the electron into this system, the low energy state will be occupied first. And if I put the electron in such a way that the Fermi level is somewhere around here, that means that some of this these uh, eigenstates or energy states can be occupied in the conduction band as well. And some of these electrons can jump over from here over to there, or some of the electrons can jump over from here to here. If that happens, then you will have conduction electrons in the conduction band, and you have holes, okay, holes, in the valence band. This is the valence band. you will have conduction electrons. And that is how the semiconductor works usually. At very, very low temperature, if you freeze the temperature, there will be no electrons in the conduction band. The semiconductor does not conduct. But if you heat it up to room temperature, you can conduct electricity. Okay, because the electrons can jump from here over to there. And if you have a metal, metal is, uh, this is a metal conductor. You have a metal, then the band diagram will look something like this. So this could be X. Of the metal, you will have a conduction band. Okay, you have a conduction band. And then you have the valence band. And then you pack the system with enough electrons so that the Fermi level has to be somewhere here. Okay, you put enough electrons into the system so that the Fermi level becomes over there. Then there will be always some amount of electrons in the conduction band. And this would always be a conductor. Okay, that is how metal is like. And if you have an insulator, then the band diagram will look something like this, and then you will have conduction band, valence band, and then the Fermi level is very close, okay, to the valence band. This is conduction. This is the case of an insulator, and there's almost no electron at all in the conduction band. And this kind of uh, medium cannot conduct electricity. Okay. You can make the amount of electrons available by changing the system by doping. Doping with holes or doping with electrons, then you can move the Fermi level up and down, depending on what available electrons you can put into the system. Okay. So this can be moved about closer to the conduction band, closer to the valence band, uh, depending on the doping of the material. And the next question that we like to ask ourselves is that, how, how do electrons and holes conduct electricity? Okay, and in the simple picture that we learned in undergraduate uh, semiconductor physics, we say that holes and electrons can conduct electricity because they are actually uh, holes being opened up, the electrons can move about. Those are the particle picture of electron conduction and hole conduction. What about the wave picture? We're trying to study the wave picture of conduction in this course. And if you were to look at the wave picture of electron conduction, it will look something like this, that 
if we have an EK diagram, okay, and the valence band might be something like this. Okay, there was as a function of x, this is a function of k. So the valence band might be something like this. And then we will have a conduction band. Okay? And then the conduction band might be partially occupied. And it might bend around over here too sometimes. Okay? And if you were to look at the wave picture of conduction in this semiconductor material, we say that if something is in a quiescent state, there will always be an electron with a positive k state and a negative k state. Okay. What it means is that for every electron that is traveling like this, there is an electron that is traveling like that. Okay, so there's no net electron traveling. This gives rise to what we call a standing wave. If you have e to the i k x plus e to the minus i k x, it gives rise to standing wave. So there's no movement of electrons if this is the case. What happens is that if you start to bias the electrons with a electric field, then there will be some electrons that have higher momentum in, say, the positive x direction, and some electrons having lower momentum in the negative x direction. And what the picture you have is that some of the states over here will be occupied, and then some of the states over here will not be occupied. Okay? So 